Hello and Namaste and welcome to this exciting episode of Sathology Debunking Mythology. Sathology means science of truth, the study of truth, opposite that, that is mythology, which means science or study of fake lie or imagination. I have a very, very special guest. He wrote a wonderful article which was published and I be, has been sent to many people internationally. And I happened to read that article. And as you know that I am interested in geopolitics because that's the best show to watch in the world nowadays. And so I thought to invite him and he is General Harsh Kakar. So that day let us welcome him to the show. Namaste and welcome sir. Namaste. Thank you. A pleasure <laughs> being here. <laughs> it's an honor to have you here. What a wonderful thought you put on, on the war in Ukraine. So, uh, before I move on, if you can tell something about yourself to the audience, because it's the first time you're coming on the show. Joined the army in 1979, superannuated in 2015. Have been uh, 36 years, been all across the country, served in Africa, that is in Mozambique as part of the UN mission. Was in Canada for six months along with the Canadian forces in the Canadian Forces College in Toronto. Been the head of department of strategic management at the College of Defense Management. Been all over since 2015. I've settled down in Lucknow. Do a lot of writing. Do a lot of YouTube discussions. Initially used to come on TV channels but uh, finally found that really to be a waste. So I prefer YouTube discussions where it's one-to-one, -one, where you're able to project your views, interact with the audience. And I think that sets a lot of tone. So that's where I am. And that's in brief. In fact, uh, one more add-on fact is that I was, I'm from the artillery, which is the big guns. And that is exactly where Ukraine and Russia are dealing with the big guns that are causing the maximum damage and the shortfall in ammunition. So, I, you know, artillery is sometimes called the god of war. So, if you, if you compare Russian artillery to Indian artillery, would you say that the Indian artillery regiment is superior to Russian or is equal? What do you say? Uh, let's put it this way. You see, the original Indian artillery uh, took off from the Russians. The Russians had 130, 155. We got the same initially for a long time. We were dependent on the Russians. The BrahMos missiles that we use today is an Indian-Russian collaboration. But in the last few years, we moved away uh, from the Russians into better equipment and more modern equipment coming in from the West, which is from the US, Israel, our own development. From the time Atman Nirbhar Bharat began, we've come out with our own collection of guns and uh, these are among the best in the world with absolute accuracy, long ranges. The Indian missile story is a history by itself and missiles complement guns. So frankly, we moved a lot away. The Russian concept of a hundred gun uh, concept, which was before you attack a target, you use mass artillery fire to destroy the target. But that was the concept at a time which the Russians used for a long time. But now the whole concept is changed because of the counter bombardment, the use of drones, the use of uh, missiles. So everything is now changed. So the whole concept has undergone a change. And today you need to have artillery which is able to deploy, fire and vanish away in the background. Change position before the counter bombardment comes. And I guess that is where we move far better than the Russians because we've, we are migrating to the faster deployed artillery, the faster moving artillery. So I guess we are moving far ahead. So, so like when we when we discuss this war, and the biggest thing which Russians have up their sleeve, I feel, and I may be wrong, is the production of ammunition. Is the supply of the ammunition is what is actually frustrating the West also in a in a big way. And I, I live in the US, so I know all the reports which are coming out is that the production is so high that the West cannot meet. The entire West cannot meet. What do you see on that? 
See, there are two things that we need to look at. Firstly, the Russian artillery ammunition is not Russia alone. The ammunition also comes uh, from North Korea. The drones that they need also come from Iran. <coughs> so this uh, group uh, and China provides dual use technology, which is of major benefit as far as the Russians are concerned. So the nexus of uh, Moscow, Pyongyang, Tehran and uh, Beijing is getting stronger as time passes. So Russians don't feel the pinch. You've got to remember that the Russian ammunition uh, factories were always there. They only had to speed up production. The Ukrainians did not really have an armament industry to cater for their needs because they never felt threatened. One of the major problems that have come up in the war over the last two years is Ukraine has not been able to boost its funds <coughs> to enhance its own defense manufacture. It is banking largely on the US and Europe. Now, you've got to look at it in another form. Europe manufactures ammunition for its own needs and its own needs are very limited. There is no war in Europe. It only caters for the expenditure of ammunition in training. So therefore, the manufacture quotient is very low. The US does manufacture. It needs its own stockpiles. After all, it doesn't know where it's going to get involved. And since the Israel-Gaza war began, it has to give it to Israel also. After all, the equipment is all the same, one double fives. It's got to give it to Ukraine. It needs it itself. Europe cannot produce the ammunition that Ukraine needs. Now, if the US also has its own problem of funding, because there are a lot of restrictions, a lot of complaints on the quantum of funds that are being given to Ukraine. If you look at it, the 95 billion deal that was just cleared by the Congress, for both Ukraine and Israel is apart from the US and Russia, the third highest expenditure on defense across the world in a year. Now, where does it come from? Now, artillery ammunition is one of the major causes why Ukraine is claiming today that its front lines are collapsing. It says for every 10 rounds the Russians fire, we can fire one. That is the state of their artillery today. Without ammunition, artillery is a sitting duck. It's very vulnerable because it can't fire, it's just sitting there. <coughs> Once located, it has almost no chance of survival. So this is where the scenario stands today. If I may, if I may uh, ask you that uh, the according to all the Western estimates and the statements made by Pentagon, on the congressional hearing, they have clearly stated that uh, the production in Russia cannot be matched by the West. I'm talking about NATO, completely NATO. In the next ten years, they said it openly. I told you that the reason is simple: NATO has faced no war. If you haven't faced a war, where is your ammunition expenditure to be able to meet? But if you don't have that. Your factory capabilities are not of that level to produce that water. Which means you have to invest or you have to switch factories, manufacturing something else into manufacturing ammunition. <coughs> that you can only do when your own nation is at work. Not to support someone else because then automatically it's going from your funds and it's impacting your economy. Now, the US arms manufacturers are not only providing for themselves, they're also providing to others, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's NATO, now it's Israel. So, this sort of spread of production, you need to have the capacity. The capacity is dependent on usage. Russians always had a large capacity, they could invest. If you look at the Russian uh, defense budget, it's gone up almost 60% from last year. So what have they done? <coughs> They've expanded the defense industry and increased production. As far as Ukraine is concerned, it is not invested in its own defense industry to increase its production. And it's banking on Western support. Now, the US has stalled it now. 
Ukraine knows in case Trump comes in, the whole scenario may change. What then? NATO or Europe? Let's forget about NATO. Look at Europe. Whole of Europe cannot produce what Ukraine needs because artillery, you can blow as much as you want. <coughs> Provided you have stockpiles coming. You've got to realize there are two things. One is availability of ammunition. Second is your logistic supply line. I can give you a lakh rounds today. But unless the supply is regular, you will expend this and look for more. And that is just what Ukraine did. Ukraine blew ammunition because it had it from the West. But fresh stocks could not come in because, this, because the production capacity was never developed unless there is a war. And the production capacity remains low because if there is no war, what do you do with the ammunition? Either you replace <coughs> outdated or you, or you replace training ammunition. In the artillery, there is nothing like dud ammunition. The training and the live ammunition is the same. So the, unless you expend it, you can't replace it. So what policy is followed across the world is as the ammunition gets older, it moves from your war way, from your war reserves to your training reserves. And fresh comes in. So depending on the quantum that you expend in a year, you produce that much. Nobody produces more than that because it has no meaning. And that has been the problem of Europe all through. It's had no war since the Second World War. Where is it to employ artillery? They have created wars all over the world. And but that's me generally using uh, the American ammunition. Correct. Right. And, uh, and I think that's the latest uh, joke which I hear generally. The Russians, when they taunt West, is that you, you can assassinate people, but you cannot fight a war. That's the taunt they give. <laughs> so your ammunition is for assassinations, not for war. That's the taunt there. And uh, every time, the recent May 1, Russia showed up all the trophies from every yes. single country. And I was shocked that Turkey was also there. And Pakistan has been providing it to Ukraine. Now, how is Pakistan getting involved is an interesting factor. Pakistan signed an agreement with two U.S. companies uh -huh. to meet the shortfalls of 155 ammunition. These were picked up by the British aircraft from Pakistan's base and transported to Ukraine <coughs> by an intermediary. Now, this ammunition happened to land up in the hands of the Russians. And that is how the whole Pakistan story is now out. And they made about 380 odd million dollars. I mean, Pakistan has been used as a Pakistan is a, is a very interesting thing and today's topic is not there, but we'll cover that sometime later because you are smiling and you have a lot to say there. <laughs> so, uh, the coming to this uh, incident here, now, now May 1, a Brahms tank and every other tank and I am personally very impressed with Arjun tank. I don't know why I love Arjun tanks from the beginning it started. It's a heavy tank. And that means less recoil. Naturally, heavy guns have less recoil. And no, speed is... Heavy tanks, heavy tanks have a problem of movement. Mm -hmm. You see, everything that has an advantage has a disadvantage. It has to be moved by train. It has to be moved by road. There are problems when, you, when your tank is heavy because the sort of bridges which you've got to cross using the tank transporters, that gets impacted. So, an advantage of a heavy tank in terms of recoil versus movement, there are issues that come into play. Then there is also the issue of the number of parts that are there in a tank. What is the impact on that? The Vijanta tank had massive collection of parts. So, what is the impact on that? Those are issues that need to be looked at. So, I think they are now working on it and I think it's going to get better and better. 
Now, even Abraham tanks are heavy, like almost Arjun and Abraham tanks are same weight generally, 68 to 70 tons. Almost that is one of the reasons why uh, the Abraham tanks have not been very successful in Ukraine. The ground conditions in Ukraine do not favor the use of heavy tanks. Now, the sad part is when Ukraine got into operations, the West rushed what it had. Russia's equipment is designed for this terrain because that is their terrain. Now, that sort of a difference is what put Ukraine in a disadvantage. If you if we compare today's scenario in Ukraine today with the scenario where India may be required to fight a long war, the whole the the whole logic of that short and swift action coming back doesn't work. Israel is facing challenges with Hamas till date, despite extensive bombing. So do you think if India gets involved in a long war, which India will not in any way, I am, I don't see India fighting with anyone right now for next maybe five years, ten years, or maybe three years, or maybe you can correct me that it may fight, but uh, I don't see anything like that. But if India gets involved in long war, how do you think the Indian artillery and the Indian army will face it with the production capacity of OFP and other all the companies are separated from OFP. How do you see that? Uh, two things. Firstly, you've got to realize both Russia and Israel are nuclear states, but they are fighting non-nuclear states. Now, when you're fighting non-nuclear states, there is no way that you can apply a threat of a nuclear weapon or you can contemplate applying one. Both India's adversaries are nuclear states and so is India. Nuclear versus nuclear states to keep it under the threshold of a nuclear war. The war has to be very limited in space and very limited in time. The way the Russians have gone deep into Ukraine, 20% of Ukrainian territory, 25% of Ukrainian territory, it may not happen with two nuclear part states. That's the first part. But yes, there can be a prolonged war, it can be a collection of skirmishes, it can be just restricted. That is a different story. <coughs> but as far as <coughs> India is concerned, in case India gets into operations, these plans exist with all countries that when you get into operations, your industries, including private industries, are converted to defense manufacturing. These plans exist. Today, the best part for India is apart from OFP, a number of private manufacturers are also producing artillery ammunition. They're producing artillery guns, they're producing artillery ammunition. ATAGS is a combination of a number of uh, uh, sort of entities and so are uh, one or two more which are undergoing trials. <laughs> LNT is involved and Bharat Forge is involved. There are groups that are involved. No, you have that. That gets into play when the nation gets into war. India believes in keeping a stockpile of, currently it is claimed to be as per what Parikar had done, 10 days WWR of war waste stage rates. These are kept for the entire Indian army. The whole army doesn't get into war at the same time because you've got two different fronts. So these reserves are available to cater for the requirement wherever there is. And they kept located at central spots and spread across to meet the needs of the troops that are there. Production capacities will get changed because the nation is going into war. The difference comes in when the nation goes into war or you're providing to others. If you are going to provide to others, you are going to keep it within your current production, not convert other industries to meet defense requirements. So there is that subtle difference that remains here. I was hearing one uh, very famous, our friend, and you know him, and he was telling me, he is an Air Force pilot, and he was, uh, uh, and he was telling me, he was part of the Balakot air strike. He said, he said one thing, he said that we are ready 
and innovation is our region very clearly he said that when it comes to naval fighting and uh, admiral uh, shashi sina also came here on the show and uh, shashi asthana also came on the show and he also said that in naval warfare no one can in in ior region we are the we are the strongest contingent and there was another comment i heard that uh, our soldiers are better than anything else in the world and we have proved that in multiple military exercises now when you ask an american i live in the us so i know many of the people here and when they say they say generally that we are the best but when it come, comes to the record of everything then excessive force for short duration is what they claim now in the case of ukraine i think you commented on the article how the west is facing a strategic defeat soldier by soldier and uh, american secret uh, mercenaries or or maybe the regular soldiers are in the ukraine already assisting them so how do you see that the this war which russia has fought and uh, cover 25% of territory and the preparation of ukraine must be so good that they are not able to move beyond 25% they have to fight village by village so the defense which they prepared for 10 years 20 2014 till now is paying off so how do you think this war will end see uh, let me start by your first comments on the india and us yes. as far as the naval forces are concerned let me put it this way very simple the indian ocean is our backyard we are operating right next to our bases the us operates from its base in guam its base in the philippines and its base in japan these are bases where the us has stocks of ammunition stocks of fuel repair depots and everything now when any other force comes into the indian ocean let's take the chinese that we keep talking about they go to operate 3000 kilometers from their base as far as the duty is concerned or han batota port is concerned these are not repair replenishment and refueling of ammunition and fuel they can just be rest halts so there's a world of a difference when you operate so far from base now when you come down to ukraine we've got to realize that as far as the russians are concerned when there is a defensive line <coughs> to break a defensive line takes time you've covered 20% of territory russia was never looking to take over complete ukraine it's too large a country for you to take over and possibly control and possibly run it's too large what russia was looking was to send a firm message and it's going to get that because ultimately when they come down to talks the talk should have happened into in uh, within a year of the war starting when turkey was conducting it but the west then believed that ukraine will be able to push russia out once we pump them with weapons equipment and ammunition and automatically it will be a strategic defeat for russia putin would go and we would gain as far as russia is concerned it backfired today <coughs> russia holds the key ukraine's front lines are collapsing by the day <coughs> the russians are moving inwards they not looking to go to keep they cannot take keep it's too far deep nobody is going to let them go to keep and nor are they keen to go to keep but where they are a time has to come now when you got to get down to talks and in the talks Russia is going to dictate what it wants. There is no second option. How long is the West going to keep funding? At some stage, you're going to look at reconstruction in Gaza. At some stage, you're going to look at reconstruction in Ukraine. Who's going to pay for it? The West. How much are you going to pay for? No, I'm, we don't want to pay. We are tired. But there is no choice. Ultimately, that is where it's going to go. I mean, whether it's, whether it's the U.S., is, whether it's Europe, it's going to go from there. <coughs> Now, what is going to be Russia's terms and conditions? 
It will warm the Donetsk and the Rusank region. There is no way it's going to back down. Crimea can never go back. Crimea was never part of Ukraine until Stalin made it. It will not go back. Zelensky will go. Ultimately, it's going to be on Russian terms because there is no choice. How long are you going to keep pumping in money, ammunition? $60 billion, <coughs> out of which $40 billion is being spent, or almost, I think, less $8 billion. The balance is being spent in the U.S. defense industry. That's right. But how long are you going to keep pumping it? How much can you pump it? Europe has started pulling back. So the point is, at some stage, you've got to sit and talk. Something what Modi has been saying from the beginning. It was coming through in Turkey. Boris Johnson flew, it, flew in and stalled the talks. Now, had he not done that action, possibly it wouldn't have come to this level. Today, within Ukraine, they're not able to get soldiers to fight. People who are of the age of being drafted are either paying to avoid the draft or running away out of the country. With the bargain, you have no one left. Russia today, to make up its shortfall, as per the latest news, I think it was yesterday or something, <coughs> they're now getting women prisoners to come to the front line. They're paying them $2,000 a month. Fight for a year, get pardoned and go home. So they are able to fulfill, their population is able to manage. Ukraine cannot. They're, the Russian economy is not being dented much. Its oil exports are continuing. Its mineral exports are continuing. Its agricultural phosphates is still going to the US. So nothing actually has stopped as far as Russia is concerned. The moment you decide to take Russian assets out, uh, which are outside the uh, outside Russia, <coughs> European and uh, American assets within Russia will be taken by Putin. All the companies that have invested and have now left, they lose all their assets. So as far as things are concerned, Russia is still holding the cards. How long? Now, if you look at a very simple statement, August last year, Zelensky admitted that the entire offensive of his has stalled. And the reason he gave, we delayed it so long that the Russians laid mines. <laughs> Anthony Blinken, at the same time, made a statement that the Ukrainian counteroffensive is going well. They've captured uh, some villages, which was absolutely false. So how long are you going to keep projecting this view and how long are you going to keep pumping? In fact, like they say, you're pushing in good money behind bad. How long? And Ukrainians are known for corruption. They're like the Pakistan of Europe. Everybody knows that the that, see, that is why if you look out of the 60 odd billion that was earmarked for Ukraine, only 8 billion is going to Ukraine for salaries. Another expenditure, which means to pay the mercenaries who have now dwindled drastically and most have moved into Israel. So you are being, you are going to pay the muscle. You are only getting 8 billion out of the entire lot, which has been released by the US. The balance is going to US defense manufacturers. And with this, you expect Ukraine to fight how long? You'll give them a collection of ammunition. They'll drag for another two months. Are you going to give them another 60 billion after two months? <coughs> so 20,000 NATO soldiers are now exercising in Poland. And with all the tanks and whatever. It's, it's like, it looks like a whole drama over there. And uh, suddenly the, the entire NATO border with Europe has been activated by Russia. I mean, they are the masters of chess. And uh, and they've activated everything, and now Hungary, and which has always been a, I thought a sane voice in Europe, and they know the reality. So, so the sane voice in Europe, and they are saying, and they're not, they're no longer, they're not friends of Russia, but there is no other option they have, and and so they are just saying. Orban has said openly that. Uh, I am not pro-Putin. I am just talking common sense. 
how can you fight and so how long will this drama continue because there are it's all a whitewash see as far as the troops being deployed in poland are concerned it is trying to send a message to russia russia is not interested in getting involved with nato why is he interested in nato unless nato decides to move in and nato cannot decide to move in because if nato decides to move in the war will go beyond control and it will get into the nuclear sphere so there is nothing that nato can do it is only there to send a message that we are protecting nato troops hungary is well aware that how much are you going to fund ukraine what are you going to end up at the end of the day with <coughs> As it is, the nations are sick of Ukrainian grain, which is going at far cheaper rates and impacting their production. So there is a lot of discontent even within Europe, even within NATO, and for them to push NATO to agree to fund Ukraine and to push Europe to agree to accept uh, Ukrainian grain is also getting to be difficult. And this is not going to last long. At some stage. NATO countries and European nations, even though are not part of NATO, Switzerland is the one that's starting off on it. Is going to talk? Let's end it. It's time we get down to dialogue. The fact is, the longer you take, the more Putin controls. The best part is Russia is no longer using the word special operations. It is now talking of war versus the West, which is getting involved with Ukraine. I think uh, what what I see right now is, uh, and it's like I said, it's the best show on the planet. Geopolitics is the best show on the planet, and it naturally gets great views on YouTube in any way. And what the American generals and s- hardly they speak because they're not allowed to speak. Even the retired ones are not allowed to speak. Uh, so some people are given permission to speak, and what it comes out is, is that the the as the war moves towards east so first the europe is going to get consumed and then they are saying that uk is going to get consumed in the last usa is going to get consumed so do you think the third world war if it's a i don't think this is going to happen because people are not ready for anyone anyone nobody is ready so is it going to be an american mainland nothing is going to happen to europe neither is putin interested in touching europe ukraine was stupidity of trying to get it into nato after repeated warnings it was absolute stupidity when there was nothing happening why instigate a fire let it remain because after all putin was not looking to expand how much can you expand when nato is on your borders the fact is that you wanted to try and expand nato and try and squeeze russia because you considered russia an enemy now if you create today you're doing the same with china at some stage there's going to be a bounce back today the philippines are handling the chinese the japanese are facing the chinese in their own area and for the us as long as indo china relations are down it is damn good the day indo china relations end and we come back to normalcy and we decide to resolve the lac the biggest loser will be the us because it will lose a very strong ally against china so you are believing that these are your enemies and you need to suppress them and that is where the bounce back starts and that's exactly what happened for years they were being warned don't expand nato into ukraine because ukraine is the entry into russia you know you hit the nail actually on indo china actually hit the nail because neither india wants a war and india is not playing into western hands don't want to go there go ahead and uh, neither china wants a war because they know how the military is really i mean they can say whatever they want they you know, the military is not our terracotta warriors they have and they they cannot fight with terracotta warriors so they, so nobody wants a war and i think of all the war mongers on the youtube will be really surprised that there is no war happening on that front also and uh, and and it's a it's a very conscious decision and a very wise decision not to play into the hands of the west 
because like you said that they have created problem spots and Dr. Ankit Shail or Shoy, he has predicted the problem shots, two hand theory, western theory, one hand create a conflict and then second hand supply weapons, the whole idea is supplying weapons. So, uh, but India has made strong postures also, Uttarakhand and everywhere else. How do you think, and I can pick your brains on this now, on this one, with the given the Indian artillery dominance, you know, everybody knows it's a dominance. Do you think that even China or any other country can even dissuade India? I mean, I was looking at the numbers, Indian armed forces, entire Middle East put together, all Central Asian states put together, is has a bigger footprint than all of them put together. And it's a very large military. So do you think any other country uh, will have a chance against the Indian military? See, the Indian military is basically being designed to ensure protection of our own borders. We have no extraterritorial interest that the government of India has made very clear. We've created our structures, we've designed our force structures, our equipment, our force levels to meet our own requirement of defending our borders. <coughs> On that, there are no two doubts. There is nobody who will be able to get in and get what they want without being paid back in the same coin. And that is something that the government of India has made clear and they've proved it and that will remain. So expecting someone to think that they'll get a cakewalk or they'll be able to achieve something easily will not happen. While tensions will remain, and whatever may happen will be skirmishes at a local level in very limited time and space. But unlikely to expand across. That is something that will not happen. And that can only be prevented when you have a force structure which acts as a deterrent. Which gives a warning that if you try something, the hit back will be double. Until you have that force structure, you can't convey the warning and that warning is being conveyed by the force structures you've created. So in case of anything happening, it's going to be local skirmishes. With Pakistan, it will be terrorist attacks. That's it. But all below the level of tolerance of India. Never will it go beyond a level that India is forced to attack. Just today, a statement of Jay Shankar came back on, on Canada. He said, very clearly, he said, we'll pay back in the same coin. So, and Canada is known to, and we all know that the Pakistan was entirely a CIA operation since 1947. And people may not know that CIA brought Dalai Lama from China to India. That's how it happened. The, it was initially supported by the CIA and to create the India-China permanent conflict. Like you said, conflict they created, Pakistan is again the CIA operation and Pakistani nuclear weapons are also found to be duds now. Looks like they don't have a nuclear weapon. And this is what the reports coming out and I'm just commenting on social media report. I have no access to anybody's data. So how do you see that the India will pay back in time or pay back with these gross interferences through intelligence operations and very funnily, funny, you know, in a very funny way, Australia said to have closed down a Indian intelligence operatives in Australia and people were very proud, India were very celebrating, wow, we are operating there too. So how do you see that the war against the some minority stupid people in the West in the intelligence agencies particularly. They are all kids actually, 23 year old kids, 25 year old kids, grew up in playing video games and they are trying to try all these things. Will India pay back on their soil? What do you say? As far as Canada is concerned, we actually, actually we have taken this a little bit too far. Just look at the timeline. Justin Trudeau came to India for the G20 summit. He wanted a bilateral. He only got aside and aside with the PM. The PM lectured him on giving space to the Khalistanis. Prior to that, he had come in 2018 with his wife and kids 
and the only thing he was doing was shooting photographs at the Taj Mahal and the Golden Temple. And he had one meeting with the PM in seven days, and that's it. Even here, he had a sit aside. At the end of it, when he had to go back, the aircraft packed up. He spent another 24 hours in it. Now, the moment he reached back, everyone mocked him. So what did you achieve at the end of the G20? You blew up so many Canadian dollars, and what was the end result? To switch the topic, he jumped on the Niger incident and blamed it. By then, possibly the five eyes may have given him some input. Now, yesterday you arrested three people. They've been living in Canada since 2021. If they were Indian intelligence operatives, India is stupid to leave them living there for, for all this time after Niger was killed, they would have been flown back. So India had nothing to do with more of gangland killing. Actually, what Justin Trudeau is doing today is he is fighting for his own survival. You look at the Khalsa rally held last week. It was his own survival which compelled him to go because Jagmeet Singh's NDF supports him without which he cannot retain power. So what he is doing is for his political survival, he is exploiting the Khalistan factor, deteriorating ties with India, which means nothing to him because he has to remain as a PM. That's it. And to continue as a PM is going to sacrifice anything and everything that comes his way. When I was with the Canadian forces for six months, the only criticism that they had was towards the U.S. forces which treated them like children. The Canadians were treated like second-rate soldiers, second-rate troops, and that is how the U.S. treated them. And they would be continuing to treat them because that is what the Canadian force structure is like. They've got nothing much. Today, politically, as far as foreign policy is concerned, India is giving you that treatment. We threw out 41 diplomats from India. What could Canada do? Nothing. But that's the way the treatment is going. And they're responsible for their own. And it will possibly continue till 2025 when they have the next elections and Justin is out. The next government will definitely look to mend fences with India. <coughs> you have to realize that why are nations running for free trade agreement with India? It is to boost their economy, not the Indian economy. Today, we have the largest market. We have the largest economy. The way, I mean, the rate of growth of our economy is massive. Today, every nation wants a free trade agreement. And who is the loser as far as India, Canada is concerned? India is going, needs nothing from Canada. You have these people, keep them. You give them, you can give them Khalistan in Ontario or in Alberta, wherever you want. But they're not going to come to India and do anything. And you give them space there, we take their property in India. Pannon's houses and land and all these <laughs> Khalistani supporters, houses and lands have all been taken over by the NIA. All their properties have gone. So basically, all is left and none of them can ever enter India. Can you believe it? Neither Jag in fact, in the Tridu government, I think uh, his defense minister was, I'm forgetting the name, he was also one of the one of NDF's members. He was on a ban from India. And so is Jagmeet Singh. They can never enter India. If you look at this is sort of relationship that you've taken it. And they're responsible for it themselves. I mean, Canada Canada is like the Kanata is the actual name, native Canadian name, Kanata. From there they came out to Canada. And uh, Kanata is a is a protectorate of British Crown and it's a colony, works still like a colony. It works on British intelligence and the CIA. And Canadians think they have a country, but it's not a country, it's a colony. And uh, and uh, Americans treat them like a colony. Yeah. And uh, and and well, and America itself is a colony of British. So in any way, so both are <coughs> colonies in any way. 
and both are used by MI6 willingly willingly. American politicians are also used and they are also used. Sometimes the name of China, in the name of deep state and all this drama goes on and on. So I think the viewers should not take it anything seriously right now. I think the most credible source of news nowadays comes from MEA, Ministry of External Affairs. If they are worried, they will say something. If they are not worried, that means everything is a hodgepodge. It's just a news for the Western media outlets. And the jokers from Washington Post and CNN and New York Post, they're all comedians. And I think the way the day Indian government bans them, they, they'll have no employees left over there. The South Asia department will vanish in a few years. Just just block the website. Everything is closed. Nothing happened. Now BBC is now outsourcing its business here because they were caught, uh, straight away caught uh, cheating on taxes. Yeah. <coughs> they got hit. And now they are outsourcing the entire BBC network in India to private players and quitting. It's a British bullshit corporation. So people can just watch it, you know, all those, you know, Clinton News Network, CNN, British bullshit corporation, and all those things. And Australia's ABC is again Australian bullshit corporation. Just keep checking them out. Just, just don't even worry about them. No American, they don't write for USA. <laughs> Nobody reads them here. They write for India. And... And the foolish Indian uh, reporters, they come here and they're very proud and we all laugh at them. <laughs> because Arfa Khanum is, 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 who is she? Nobody <laughs> knows about her name. Half the Americans will not even pronounce her name. <laughs> or, I mean, you ask anybody on the coffee shop, have you heard about this? Who's, what? They don't <laughs> care. They're worried about their daily morning Starbucks only. No, no, so don't take them seriously. And uh, so, and and you correctly said your direct experience the Canadian Armed Forces. Literally, in Europe, all the jokes are made on Polish. In US, all the jokes are made on Canadians. <laughs> and this is the reality. So, so uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I really wanted to bring home the light that what you see is not what the reality is, and what you hear is not the reality. And why you should give credence to a foreign minute, foreign reporters in any way. And, and what is the need of hiring an Indian analyst in USA? It's, it's a comedy show, actually, total comedy show. It's like a CIA has lost his brains and therefore they are doing all the stupidity everywhere. And we can talk very freely about it because uh, now CIA itself has become a laughing stock on social media right now. So, so you know, what kind of intelligence agency is that where everything they do is visible to the market? Everybody is talking about it. <laughs> I just feel like that way. What Ra does, nobody knows. Others report actually. If they are doing something. That's the difference. <laughs> that's a difference. That's a real intelligence agency anyway. So, stop worrying. Be happy. Samosa khaiye, chai pije and be happy. Have samosa and chai and just relax and watch. If you want to have some more entertainment, watch Jay Shankar's press, press meets actually. And uh, and by the way, uh, you know, the, Dr. Ankit Shari, many people have co already commented that the Indian Foreign Office is going to be equivalent to the President of the United States in a few years' time. So just wait and watch. So namaste and thank you all for joining. I hope you enjoyed the show. And General Harsh Kakar was also very, he was laughing at the entire show because he knows what the reality is. So nobody is worried actually. So just uh, focus on our own welfare, spiritual side and material side and just focus on our lives. Forget the show which is going on. Watch it for entertainment purposes only. That's it. So till next time sir, we'll call you again. That. Something else, some other show. I hope you enjoyed the discussion also today. Thank you. Enjoyed it today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Oh, nice. Namaste. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.